Good morning. I'm glad to be here this morning. I'm glad to have the opportunity, as always, on Lord's Day, to gather with members of His body and to worship Him and honor Him uh, in spirit and in truth. For a little while this morning, I'm going to talk about a Bible character by the name of Joseph. And to kind of, uh, as a reading before the prayer, I want to read from Acts chapter 7. I'm going to read an excerpt from Stephen's sermon there in the book of Acts. I'm going to read verses 9 and 10 of Acts chapter 7. Stephen says, And the patriarchs, becoming envious, sold Joseph into Egypt, but God was with him, and delivered him out of all his troubles, and gave him favor and wisdom in the presence of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And he made him governor over Egypt and all his house. There's a lot of information uh, about Joseph in the book of Genesis. We're not going to be able to talk about everything or every learn every lesson that might could be learned from the story of Joseph. And I hope that if you're not familiar with this story, that you'll go home and you'll read it and study it for yourself. But there are some points that I want to try to make. One of the main ones that we'll talk about after prayer is that I believe the story of Joseph teaches us some very important lessons about God's providence, about how God still works even today in our lives. We can learn about that from the story of Joseph. And also this morning, I believe that there are many similarities uh, between the life of Joseph and the story of Joseph and the life of Jesus. And the way Joseph is able, uh, even though things are not always good, even though he goes through some tough and some trying times, really it's because of him and through him that God saves, uh, in a way, the world, but especially the Israelites. And so there's a lesson there, there's a, a picture there, I think, that God intends for us to understand about who Jesus is and how Jesus was able to save us from our sins. And then uh, probably we'll finish up this afternoon or this evening and talk about the forgiveness of Joseph. Talk about the reunion between Joseph and his family at the end of his life. But that's, that's kind of where we're going. And hopefully what I have to say will be edifying to everybody here. But before we go further, we want to pause in our service and go to God in a word of prayer. So please humble yourself in some manner while we pray. <laughs> So as we begin to look at the story of Joseph, I want to begin by talking a little bit about providence. And the verse that I always go to when talking about God's providence is Romans chapter 8 and verse 28. Um, there's a lot of information here in this chapter, but here in verse 28 of Romans 8, the Bible says that we know that all things work together for good to them that love, to them that love God, to them who are the called according to to his purpose. Now, the word providence is not found in Scripture. But it is a topic that is interwoven throughout the entire Bible. Paul doesn't say that everything that happens is good, but that God is able to use the things that happen to bring about good. And I think we'll see that in the life of Joseph. Not everything that happens in his life would we say is good. He's sold by his brothers. He's falsely accused and thrown in prison. Uh, a lot of bad things happen to him. But as we'll see at the end, God is able to use even those bad, those terrible things that happen, and use them to bring about his purpose. And that's what God's providence is. Now, one thing we notice, is God's providence does not require miracles. Now, Joseph does have a revelation. I don't know exactly how much he has, but we know he has the ability to interpret dreams. And we'll see that even from a very young age. We don't know for sure how old he is when he begins to dream. But Joseph is, is given visions in dreams, and he's given the ability to interpret dreams. And, and certainly, you know, I don't believe that people today have that ability. But God's providence... God can still work today in our lives. It does not require miracles. Um, now, obviously, 
it's, it's hard, especially in tough times, especially when things are not going well. It's very hard to understand exactly how God's providence works. I think about my own life, and certainly I've not suffered anything like what we're going to study this morning about what Joseph suffered. But when I look at my own life, and look at when some of the bad things that have happened, you know, in the midst of the problem or difficulty or whatever it is, sometimes it seems like, how are you going to recover? How are you going to get out of it? But almost every time, at least in my case, once it's over, once you get through, you find out you're actually better off. And uh, I can't say with certainty that in every case that's necessarily God willing that to happen or making it happen, but I do believe that God works in our lives. And we'll see that is obviously the case in... In, in, in Joseph's case. Now, again, when Joseph is in prison, and when Joseph is sold as a slave by his own brothers, you know, I don't know what he thought about God's providence. But it's not until towards the end of his life that he's able to look back, even though he's got revelation, it's really not until the end of his life he's able to look back and say, this was God working in my life. And I think that's the way it is uh, oftentimes, and so we may, nobody really can understand the full, the fullness of God's providence. But there are some things we can learn. It's much easier to understand after the problems are over. You look back, and certainly that's the case with Joseph. Another verse, another passage that I like to go to talking about providence is in Genesis chapter twenty-two. This, of course, is when Abraham is tested. And God asks him to take his only son. Now, technically it's not his only son, but it's the only son that God has promised him. It's the only son that had a miraculous birth. And he tells him to take his son Isaac and go offer him as a sacrifice. And so, here in Genesis 22, Abraham and Isaac are on their way up the hill to make this sacrifice. And we're getting in verse 6 of Genesis 22. It says, And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac, his son, and he took the fire in his hand and a knife. And they went both of them together. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father. And he said, Here I am, my son. And he said, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? <coughs> and Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. I don't know what Abraham fully understood about God's providence. I don't know what Abraham thought was going to happen up, up there on that hill. In, fact, in Hebrews 11, it talks about how that uh, Abraham received Isaac back from the dead in a, in a type or in a figure. But just the faith that Abraham says, whatever happens, it's in God's hands. God will provide. That's really what I think God's providence is. God provides. And it may not always be what I expect. It may not always come when I think it should. It's going to be according to his time and his purpose. But God provides. And that's exactly what Abraham taught, said to his son Isaac here. And that's exactly what we see in the life of Joseph. Well, we're going to just kind of hit some of the high points here at first. Uh, again, I don't have time to talk about everything. But the story of Joseph basically takes place between Genesis chapter 37 and Genesis 50. It's at the end of the book of Genesis. And Joseph is toward the end of the uh, patriarchal age. Now, basically there's three ages or three dispensations of time. I don't have time to get into all of that. But Marcus talked last week about John the Baptist. And now that John sort of stood between the old law and the law of Christ, the new covenant. That's kind of how it is with Joseph. The story of Joseph uh, for God's people, Israel, kind of bridges the gap between the old patriarchal system and the law of Moses, which was to come. Now, there's about 400 years or so between the story of Joseph and when Moses actually writes, receives the law on Mount Sinai and writes even this story down. What's important for us to recognize, and this comes up over and over again, when Moses writes the events that, of Genesis about the creation and all the other things that happen in Genesis, 
He didn't invent those stories. <laughs> and many of the older uh, Jews, the older Israelites, would have known those stories. Really all of them would because they told them. It passed down. In fact, during the patriarchal system, before anything was written down, that's the way God worked. I don't know exactly how he revealed himself, but he revealed himself to, Ab to first Adam. But on down through the patriarchs, he revealed himself, he gave his will, and it was passed on orally from father to son. And so when Moses is writing down the events that occur in Genesis, it's not the first time these people have heard this, it's just the first time it's been written down. And uh, the story of Noah and the flood, for example, sometimes people will say, well, no, Moses got that story from uh, the story of Gilgamesh. But what you have, you have to understand, Moses is not, this is not the first time these stories have been told. It's just the first time they've been written down. And so Moses is, is writing this down about 400 years after the events happened. He's writing this down as the children of Israel are wandering around, wandering around in the wilderness for those 40 years before they, after they leave Egypt, before they go into Canaan. And the story of Joseph explains how the Israelites got to Egypt in the first place. Why is it that they're even in Egypt, and why was it necessary for God to bring them out? That's how it would have applied to the Israelites when it was first given. But there's obviously many lessons for us as well. And Joseph lived a life of ups and downs, and really, anybody's life is like that. Now, we may not get as far as low as Joseph did. You know, I've certainly never been thrown into prison because I was falsely accused. And uh, although I guess that could happen, but uh, we may, and, and, and you know, we may not get as high as Joseph did. I mean, he's made second in command over the the uh, the superpower at that time. Egypt is the is the world empire at this time, and Joseph is made second in command. But certainly, all of us can identify with ups and downs, even if they're not quite as extreme as what Joseph experienced. Joseph is the son of Jacob and Rachel. And that's important because if you know the story of, of Jacob, Rachel is really the wife he wanted. He was tricked, deceived by his father-in-law into uh, marrying uh, Rachel's sister, but Rachel really is the one Jacob wanted to begin with. And Joseph is the firstborn uh, from that relationship. And of course, Rachel dies in childbirth when, when Joseph's younger brother Benjamin is born. One thing that's also important when you think about this story, Joseph has ten older brothers, but there's probably not a huge age gap between Reuben the oldest and Joseph who's number ten. Because Jacob essentially had four wives. And so, even though there's, there, yes, there's twelve sons, but they came from four different women, so it's, you know, Several of them could have been born in the same year. Uh, and so there may have only been a few years between uh, Reuben and Joseph. And so the age difference is probably not what we would expect from our own experience because there's four wives. But anyway, he's this firstborn son of, of Rachel. And he has ten older brothers, one younger. And of course, as I already mentioned, uh, you can read that Rachel dies in childbirth when Benjamin is born in Genesis chapter 35. Joseph is loved by his father. And this is part of the problem. Obviously, it's not wrong for Jacob to love Joseph. He, you know, the father should love his children. But Joseph was Jacob's favorite. And again, if you know anything about this story, this has been a problem for this family in the past. In fact, there was trouble between Jacob and Esau. Because Esau was Isaac's favorite, and uh, Jacob was Rebekah's favorite. And that led to problems. Well, I believe there's, there's problems here because of this situation as, as well. Now, part of what happens, and there's a lot of things that we just can't talk about, but I do think a lot of the reason why there's a special relationship between Jacob and Joseph is not necessarily because jo J Jacob chose Joseph as his favorite, but they share a connection. Because Joseph is a dreamer, and Jacob also was a man who dreamed. In fact, you remember when Jacob first leaves uh, 
uh, Canaan. He leaves Isaac and Rebekah. He goes back up there to Haran to find a wife. While he's on the way, he gets to Bethel and he uh, finds a place to sleep on the ground and he has a dream. And he sees a, a ladder or a stairway that reaches from earth all the way to heaven. Well, Je jo Je Joseph, <laughs> we get tongue tied this morning, but Joseph also had dreams. In fact, one time he has a dream that he and his brothers are out working in the field. They're harvesting some kind of grain, whether it's wheat or whatever, we don't know. But Joseph's sheave stands erect. And the sheaves of his brothers circle around his and bow down, paying homage to his sheep. Of course, they don't need Joseph to interpret that dream. The brothers understand exactly what that means. Joseph is trying to tell them that uh, one day they're going to serve him. His older brothers. Now, this is a time when, uh, you know, if you were the oldest son, that meant something. Now, I guess it still kind of means something today, but it was different back then. The law demanded that the oldest son received a double inheritance as of, compared to everybody else. And so it was offensive to them that Joseph was telling them that they were going to serve him. And, you know, I don't know what they thought. Uh, I don't know if they just thought that Joseph made this up or, or what, but, but uh, they were offended because of Joseph's dream. Another time, he had a dream that somehow the stars paid him homage. And even the moon, the sun and the moon, suggesting that even his father and his mother one day would be below him in some way. And again, they're offended. But you know, the Bible says when he had that dream, that Jacob kept it in mind. Jacob remembered. I think Jacob at least believed that these weren't just dreams, but that God was showing Joseph visions. Now, I don't guess, apparently his, his other brothers didn't understand that. <coughs> But I believe that's probably what Jacob thought. Well, then there was the coat of many colors. And there's a lot of things we could say about that. I just want to leave you with a question. Why is there no tribe of Joseph? I'm not going to give you the answer. I think it's tied into this, what this coat of many colors was about. But you think about all the other sons of Jacob, Reuben, uh, Simeon, and Levi, uh, Judah, all of jo Joseph's brothers all had a tribe that they represented when they finally entered the promised land some 400 years later. There is no tribe of Joseph. Why not? <laughs> well, I'm just going to leave you with that. I think there's a, there's a connection there with this coat of many colors. But this coat of many colors was a prized possession. And it's again something that made Joseph's brothers envious of him. And so they hated him. And so in Genesis chapter 37, when Joseph is 20 or 17 years old, uh, Jacob knows his sons. They're up to no good a lot of times. And he sends Joseph, even though he's younger, he sends Joseph to go and check on his brothers. And uh, again, that's another story, but they see him coming when he's still a long ways off. I guess they recognize that coat of many colors and they begin to scheme how they're going to get rid of this brother that they hate. And uh, they throw him into a, a pit and uh, they begin to scheme on how they're going to kill him, basically. Eventually, though, it's Judah that speaks up and says, you know, we, we don't have to kill him. In fact, we don't want his, his blood to be on our hands. Let's sell him. They see some Ishmaelites or some Midianites that are on their way to Egypt and they deal in various kind of goods. Sometimes they even deal in uh, human slaves. And so they sell their brother Joseph to these uh, Midianites for 20 pieces of silver. And he's taken off into uh, Egypt. And they take that coat of many colors and they soak it in the blood of a goat, I believe it is, and uh, take it back to Jacob and act like they don't know whose it is. They just found it. And, of course, Jacob recognizes it. And Jacob, because of that, thinks that Joseph is dead. And as far as Jacob is concerned, Joseph is no more. 
Now there's a lot of other things that happen between uh, Jacob and his sons while Joseph is in Egypt, but we're just going to stick to the story of Joseph. And I found this little graphic. I didn't uh, make this. I found it on the internet, but I thought it worked pretty good uh, for the story of Joseph, and so I'm going to use it. But this kind of gives us an illustration for what Joseph's life was like. And so he sold to these Midianites. In Genesis chapter 37 and verse 2, the Bible says that there passed by Midianites, merchant men, and they drew and lifted up Joseph out of the pit and sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver, and they brought Joseph into Egypt. And so now he's gone from being the favored son of his father to being sold by his brothers, his older brothers, as a slave. And he's carried off into Egypt. When he gets to Egypt, uh, in Genesis chapter 39 and verse 1, the Bible says, And Joseph was brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard of the Egyptian, bought him for the hands or of the hands of the Ishmaelites, which had brought him thither. And so now Joseph is a slave in Egypt. But what's interesting is even though he's a slave, even though he's been sold by his brothers, and I, I don't know what he thought, but Jacob was a wealthy man. Uh, it wouldn't have been that big of a deal for Jacob to find out where Joseph was and to go buy him back. Now, Joseph doesn't know that his brothers told his father that he's dead. I don't know what he's thinking. But uh, even though all this has happened, Joseph does not lose his faith. Joseph does not become bitter. He doesn't uh, wallow in self-pity. He just does what he can. He does his best. And because of that, God blesses him. And he's placed over uh, all of Potiphar's house. In verse 2 of Genesis 39, And the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And so Potiphar recognizes that there's something different. There's something special about Joseph. And so he puts Joseph over his entire estate. Joseph is in control of of all the house of Potiphar. But of course, that's not the end of the story. Joseph's not done with the bad parts yet because Potiphar had a wife. And Joseph, I don't know for sure how old he is by this time, probably about 20 or so. He was 17 when he was sold. He probably was in the house of Potiphar for a little while anyway before he was made the head of Potiphar's house. But Potiphar's wife notices Joseph and she desires him. In Genesis chapter 39, beginning here in verse 7, it says, And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph, and she said, Lie with me. But he refused and said unto his master's wife, Behold, my master wadeth not what is with me in the house, and he hath committed all that he hath to my hand. There is none greater in this house than I, Neither hath he kept back anything from me but thee, because thou art his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? And it came to pass as she spake to Joseph day by day, that he hearkened not unto her to lie uh, by her or to be with her. Notice, this is not just something that happens once. This is a daily occurrence. I don't know how long this goes on. I don't know how long for sure that Joseph is in the house of Potiphar, but this is a daily occurrence. This is a daily temptation. This is something that Joseph is confronted with daily. But he refuses to yield. He refuses to sin. And uh, what I think is interesting, you know, he goes through this whole list of why it would be wrong for him to uh, be with his master's wife in this way. And he talks about how that Potiphar has been good to him and given him all that he has. But he, really, he finally gets to the, 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 the core of the matter there in verse 9. And he says, how then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Joseph understood that, yeah, you know, I don't know what kind of a woman Potiphar was. I don't know for sure what all Joseph was thinking. But it's very possible that they could have kept this a secret. Potiphar wouldn't have to know. Uh, 
it, it wouldn't necessarily affect Joseph's work with Potiphar if they could keep it a secret. But Joseph understood, even if they could keep it a secret, it's a great wickedness and it's a sin against God. He has a very different attitude than, for example, David. You know, David was a great man. The Bible says he's a man after God's own heart. And yet, when he's given the temptation, when he sees Bathsheba, when he's up on the rooftop, he doesn't think about what God thinks about it at all. And he does everything he can to cover up that sin, including even having her husband killed. Joseph, though, recognizes you might can hide something from everybody. You might can fool your parents. You might can fool your boss. You might can fool your spouse. But God knows. And this would be a great wickedness and a sin against God. Look at what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 18 through 20. He says, flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but, the, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God. Joseph understood this. Joseph understood that his body was not something he could just treat however he wanted to, or do whatever he wanted. He was God's. And he, it was up to him, he had a responsibility to keep himself pure in the eyes of God. And that's still true today. Now I know uh, that's unpopular. You know, uh, fornication, all kinds of sexual immorality are glorified everywhere you look. Especially if you've got a TV. But God still considers it a great wickedness. And Joseph said, how can I Commit so great a wickedness and sin against God. That must be our attitude today as Christians as well. And it doesn't matter what sin you want to put in there. We have a responsibility, as Joseph did, to keep ourselves pure. Well, you remember what happens. Finally, I don't know how long it takes, but finally, after Potiphar's wife is convinced that she's never going to have her way, she uh, conspires to make everything... Uh, you know, everybody's out of the house. It's just her and Joseph, and she does her best to seduce him, and he runs out. But he leaves his coat behind in her hands. And so when Potiphar gets home, she tells Potiphar that uh, Joseph had tried to <coughs> rape her. And she has this coat as evidence. And so here in Genesis chapter 39 and verse 20, it says, And Joseph's master took him. And put him into the prison, a place where the king's prisoners were bound, and he was there in the prison. I wonder what Potiphar actually thought. Because he's the captain of the guard. Some translations say he's the chief executioner of Pharaoh. It's not... A big thing, probably, to a man like Potiphar to have somebody killed, one of his slaves especially, if he thinks that uh, this accusation is true. I wonder if maybe Potiphar wasn't really sure. But what's he going to do? He can't accuse his wife of being a liar. I don't know. Maybe it's just the providence of God preventing Potiphar from having Joseph killed. I don't know exactly how it happens. But he, anyway, whatever, he's thrown in prison. And this also kind of resonates with me in the current climate we live in, current culture we live in. Um, I don't want to minimize, uh, you know, sexual assault, rape, but it, but it seems like every time you turn the TV on, somebody's accusing, accusing somebody else. And I don't know, maybe they're all true, and, I, and if they are, then people should be punished. But this is a case where Joseph is falsely accused. He's done nothing wrong. And this woman accuses him of uh, rape. And he's thrown in prison. And again, he's done nothing wrong. He's simply done his job. He's done what he uh, should have done. And yet, he's thrown into prison for simply doing what's right. But of course, 
God's still with him. Now he's been the favorite son of his father Jacob. He's been sold as a slave. Now he's a prisoner. But Joseph doesn't give up. Joseph doesn't lose his, lose his faith. He doesn't become bitter. Now he might have been thinking, you know, this is not fair. How can I, a good Jewish boy who's done my best to serve the Lord, how can I find myself in this condition? This is not fair. How could God allow a good person to be treated so bad? Is God unjust? Has God forsaken me? I don't know that Joseph asked any of these questions. If he did, he didn't spend too much time on them because he still did what he was supposed to do. He still did his best. And it's not long before the warden of the prison recognizes. In fact, in verses 21 and 22 of Genesis 39, it says, But the Lord was with Joseph. Now think about that. Joseph has been sold as a slave. He's been falsely accused and now he's in prison. And yet the Bible says the Lord is with Joseph. What's your attitude when things don't go the way you think they should? Have you ever been falsely accused? Have you ever suffered because of what somebody else did or what somebody else said about you? What's your attitude when that happens? I'm not saying that, that you know, any of that's good and that we should, you know, bad things don't happen, but we don't have a choice in some of that, but we do have a choice about what our attitude is, about how we react to those kind of situations. And Joseph chose to recognize even in these bad times, the Lord was still with him and he was still going to serve the Lord. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison committed Joseph's hand all the prisoners that were in this prison. And whatsoever they did there, he was the doer of it. And so I don't know how long Joseph's in prison, but it probably doesn't take too long for the warden to realize there's something different about Joseph. He's been falsely accused. He is not here because he deserves to be. He's a good man, and he is put in charge of the prison. Well, you remember what happens. There's a couple other men. He's in the prison with all other Pharaoh's prisoners. And there's a couple other men that he's in prison with, and they have dreams. One man uh, had been Pharaoh's uh, cupbearer or butler. And uh, anyway, he had a, a dream that he, he couldn't interpret another man had been <coughs> baker pharaoh's baker he uh i don't know what all he baked bread and whatever but but uh, they were for whatever reason they'd done something to offend pharaoh and they're in prison well they can't understand their dreams they can't interpret them they don't know i, I guess they they understand that, that, that they're different than just regular dreams but they don't know what they mean well joseph hears about it and he's able to interpret their dream. And he says, uh, he tells the butler, the cupbearer, that his dream means that in three days he's going to be restored back <coughs> to his former position. And he's going to serve Pharaoh. To the other man, he doesn't get quite so good news. He tells him that in three days, uh, Pharaoh's going to have him killed. He's going to have his head cut off. And so, just like Joseph said, these three days later, these things happen. Now he tells that cupbearer to remember him when he gets back in service of Pharaoh. He tells him, you remember that I'm here uh, not because I've done anything wrong, but that I was sold by my brothers back in Canaan. I was falsely accused, and that's why I'm in prison. You tell Pharaoh that I'm here, and I don't deserve to be. But of course, like often happens, and in the story of Joseph, things you know never going to turn out the way he thinks they are, I guess. The butler goes back and serves Pharaoh and forgets all about it. Until two years later, in Genesis chapter 41, Pharaoh has a dream. Pharaoh dreams seven cows come out of the Nile River. And they're the best cows he's ever seen. 
They're fat. They look good. He's never seen cows like these. And then seven other ones come out, but they look like they're about to die. They're skinny and mangy, and Pharaoh probably thinks they just need to be put out of their misery. But those seven skinny cows eat the seven fat ones. Now that would be strange in and of itself because cows don't eat meat. <laughs> but that's what he sees. The seven skinny cows eat the seven fat ones. But after they eat them, they, they, they still look just as bad as they did before. And, and Pharaoh wakes up. He can't. It, it, it's disturbing to the point that it wakes him up out of his sleep. I don't know how long it takes him to go back to sleep, but he finally goes back to sleep, and then he has another dream. He sees a stalk of grain. I don't know if it's wheat or corn or what. Some kind of grain, and it's got seven heads on it. And they are full. It's Again, it's the best stalk, the best crop he's ever seen. But on that same stalk, seven other heads come up, and they're, there's just not much to them. Looks like they've been eaten by locusts, or a sandstorm has blown all their crop away. They just don't look like there's much to them. But somehow those seven gaunt heads consume the seven full ones. And again, there's no change. Well, this time Pharaoh wakes up and he can't go back to sleep. And he calls all of his wise men, all of his sorcerers, you know, uh, 400 or so years later when Moses comes to, obviously a different Pharaoh, and uh, tells Pharaoh to let his people go. Moses brings out his, his magicians. You know, and they're able to mimic some of Moses' uh, miracles. Well, this is the same kind of deal that this Pharaoh does. He calls all of his sorcerers to him to try to interpret this dream, and they can't. <coughs> and so in the midst of all this, the cupbearer remembers Joseph. He says, there's a guy that I met in prison, and he doesn't deserve to be there, and he can interpret dreams. And so Pharaoh has Joseph brought out of prison. He hey, makes him, they clean him up, they shave him, they give him new clothes, and finally he's brought before Pharaoh. And here in Genesis chapter 41, verses 25 through 27, the Bible says, And Joseph said unto Pharaoh, Now imagine this, okay? Joseph, at this time, he's, we find out later he's 30 years old. So he's been in Egypt for about 13 years. He's been a slave. He's been in prison. Hasn't seen or heard from his family in all that time. And now he's in front of the king of Egypt. The most powerful man in the world. And look at what he says. Joseph said unto Pharaoh, The dream of Pharaoh is one. God hath showed Pharaoh what he is about to do. The first thing Joseph says, and it's actually a few verses before this, but the first thing Joseph says to Pharaoh is it's not me. I can't interpret your dream. It's God who can interpret dreams. And God has given you this dream because he's going to tell you what he's about to do. And so Joseph says, you had two dreams, but they're really just one. They're both telling the same story. In fact, uh, I understand before, just before we moved here, George Batty came here and talked about Revelation. And he uses this dream as part of his sermon. Now, I, I don't know what he preached here exactly, but I've heard him preach other places. And uh, he calls this parallelism. And he applies that to his interpretation of Revelation, which I think is the best one I've heard. But uh, that's what Joseph says. You had two dreams, but they're really just one. God's telling you one story. He's telling you what he's about to do. Verse 26. The seven good kind are seven years, and the seven good years are seven years. The dream is one. And the seven thin and ill-favored kind that came up after them are seven years. And the seven empty ears blasted with the east wind shall be seven years of famine. So what Joseph tells Pharaoh is that each one of those cows and each one of those stalk of those heads of grain represents a year. And you're about to have seven good years. Not just good years. The best years you've ever seen. There's going to be so much uh, crop. So much harvest. 
there's going to be more than you could ever use. But just behind those seven years of plenty, there's coming a famine. And it's the worst one you've ever seen. It's going to be like those seven years of plenty never happened. And so he says, what you need to do is you need to set up a system. <laughs> you need to set up uh, some officers in charge and fix a way to store one-fifth of the harvest over the next seven years. That way when the famine comes, you'll have plenty left over. <coughs> you can survive the famine. And so that's what Joseph tells Pharaoh. And Pharaoh responds in verses 38 through 40 of Genesis 41. And Pharaoh said unto his servants, Can we find such a one as this, a man in whom the Spirit of God is? And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, For as much as God has showed thee all this, there is none so discreet and wise as thou art. Thou shalt be over my house, and according unto thy word shall all my people be ruled. Only in the throne will I be greater than you. And so what happens? Because Joseph is able to interpret this dream, really it's God, right? Joseph, God through Joseph interprets this dream. Pharaoh says, now I'm going to make you ruler over all of Egypt. And that's where we're going to end the story here this morning. We'll finish the rest of the story this afternoon where Joseph is reunited with his family. But what I'm going to do for the rest of my time, which is just about gone, is talk about some of the ways that Joseph is similar to Jesus. Because here now, Joseph has gone from being the favorite son of his father to being sold as a slave to serving time in prison to now being made ruler over basically the entire world. <laughs> Egypt is the only world empire at this time. It is the superpower. And Joseph is made second in the command over that entire empire. Now, think about that in reference to Jesus. Jesus is the Son of God. John says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus has always been. And yet He left heaven to be born of a virgin and to live as a man and then he was crucified on the cross and now he's being made ruler over all rulers king over all kings Paul says in Philippians chapter 2 beginning in verse 5 now I can't hardly talk about this with first saying this um Yes, I do believe the story of Joseph in many ways points to Jesus. But it's also a lesson for us. It ought to point to my life. It ought to teach me how I should live. And really in Philippians chapter 2, the first four verses, that's what Paul's talking about to the Philippians. He says, you need to be humble. You need to learn how to not look down on others, but value others. And then in verse 5, it says, because that's how Jesus did. That's the kind of example that Jesus left us. He says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the, kindness, in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Now what happened because of that? He says, wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven, and things in earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Jesus humbled himself. Now the difference is, Joseph didn't have a choice. Joseph wouldn't have chose to be sold by his brothers. Joseph didn't choose to become a slave. Joseph didn't choose to be falsely accused and thrown in prison. Jesus did it by choice. Nobody could have forced him. He chose to become a man. He chose to suffer and die for us. That's the kind of Savior we serve. That's the kind of God we serve. And the whole story of Joseph points 
to that. And that's the kind of life we must live if we're going to live for Him. We're going to be Christians. We must learn to be humble and to humble ourselves before uh, not only God, but also our brethren. Well, I'm going to skip now to Genesis chapter 50. And uh, like I said, we'll fill in some of that gap this afternoon, hopefully. But the end of Joseph's life, in Genesis chapter 50, verses 24 and 25, it says, And Joseph said unto his brethren, I die, and God will surely visit you, and bring you out of this land into, unto the land which he swore to Abraham, to Isaac and to Jacob. And Joseph took an oath of the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and ye shall carry up my bones from hence. Now I want you to think about this. What's Joseph telling them? By the time Joseph dies, uh, he's been in Egypt longer, but the whole, all the Israelites have been in Egypt for going on 100 years. He's, uh, he's 30 when he visits Pharaoh, so the, well, he's 39 when Jacob and the rest of his family come to Egypt. Like I said, we'll tell that story this afternoon. He dies at 130. Maybe, maybe it's 110. I don't know. Maybe it's not as long as I thought it was. But anyway, it's a good long while they lived in Egypt. I think it's, I think it's Jacob that says it's 130 when he meets Pharaoh. I'm getting numbers mixed up in my head. But anyway, Joseph lives for a long time. And it's, it's many years that the Israelites are in Egypt uh, after Joseph brings them there. But he wants them to know before he dies that Egypt <coughs> is not home. At some point in the future... God's going to send somebody to deliver you and take you back home. And so what I want you to do, you know, when Jacob died, they carried his bones back into Canaan and they buried him in Canaan. Joseph said, what I want you to do, is when I die, you embalm me, keep me in a sarcophagus, and when you finally go back to Egypt, you take me with you. And when you read in Exodus, among all the spoils that they brought out of Egypt because of the plagues that God brought on them, one of the things they brought out of Egypt was a box that held Joseph's bones. And he tells them, this is not your home. God is going to come and take you home. Now I'm going to look at what Jesus says in John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3. Jesus says, let not your heart be troubled. Now by the way, this is right before he dies also. You know, uh, John, there are several chapters there that all take place in the last few hours of Jesus' life. In John chapter 13, you read about the, the final meal. He doesn't really talk about the Lord's Supper, but he mentions that final meal, and he talks about how the Jesus washed their feet. Then he spends several chapters talking about what's going to happen after he dies. And I don't think they really understood that's what he was talking about. That's what he was talking about. He's talking about when the Holy Spirit would come and teach them and guide them into all truth. In verse, uh, chapter 17, we have the Lord's prayer that he prayed. You know, the other accounts talk about how the, he prayed in the garden, and the, the only thing it really reveals is that he prayed, you know, let this cup pass from me, but he said, not my will, but your will. Well, uh, part of that other prayer, I believe, is John chapter 17. Now, I don't know the exact chronology, uh, timing of it, but one of the things that really stands out to me if you read in John's account, right after he finishes that prayer, they cross over uh, the brook Kidron uh, up on the Mount of Olives getting toward Gethsemane. And so during all that time, and that, I don't have time to talk about John 17 this, this morning, but, but that, that all is about the same time when Jesus is, is, is suffering because of what he knows is coming. Well, this is not much before that. It's the same night. In John chapter 14, he knows he's about to die. He says, let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Notice, like Joseph, some of the last words that Jesus said before he would die is, this world is not your home. I'm going over yonder, and I'm going to prepare a place for you. 
And then I'm going to come back. And when I come back, I'm going to take you home. That's pretty much the same message Joseph had for the Israelites at his death. And that's what Jesus wants each one of us to know. And I just want to leave you with that point. That's where I want to go. That's where God wants you to go. And that's where I want you to go also. And because of Jesus, not because of how good I am or how good any of us are, none of us deserve it, but because of Jesus, we can go there. Because Jesus chose to give up his life in heaven and to humble himself as a man and to die on the cross, we can go there. If we will just put our faith in him and if we'll live, for him. The lesson is yours. Hopefully what I've had to say has been edifying. Of course, we never close.